Hello and welcome to the Limerick Post podcast. We are Limerick. I'm your host, Keen Reinhardt. Join me each week as we get to know the people of Limerick who are making the city and county what it is today. You can keep up to date with all Limerick news, sport and entertainment by following the hashtag Keeping Limerick Posted across all our social media channels or visiting limerickpost.ie. I'm now joined in studio with Dave Burke from Zero, metal band in Limerick. Dave, how are you getting on? One of the founding members of Zero. Not too bad, man. Yeah, how is everything going? Brilliant. I'd say you had a busy while for the last year or so, have you? Yeah. Yeah, we had a lot going on. I think uh, the first time we met was about two years ago. And I think so, I think yeah. a lot has changed since then and a lot of work has been done. Yeah. yeah so uh, what's been going on with you for the last couple of years? Mm. Uh, writing and recording, doing gigs when they come up. Um, there was kind of a shift in our mentality recently because, I don't know, there seemed to have been a drought countrywide in gigs. So yeah. we threw ourselves into uh, writing and recording. And um, we hooked up with a couple of people from abroad and did some collaboration work again. Yeah. So, uh, when we first met, you were still working with people abroad who were producing tracks for you or editing, you know. Yeah. So how was that process work? Uh, a lot of file sending. Yeah. To and fro, and uh, sending them between countries and between studios. It's not always the easiest thing to do. I'd say it gets a bit frustrating, would it? Very. Yeah. Very, especially when when you're writing a song and you have a sound in mind. Yeah. And it's this big, grandiose thing, the final edit that you can hear in your head and you know where you want it to go. But when you have people from different studios with different gear and different rooms and they're all recording par- parts that go together, compromises have to be made in the sound. So it always ends up sounding different to how you want it to, but you have to allow it to do that as well. Which I suppose is one of the nice things about it. You don't have complete control. Yeah. So, but I think uh, when we first spoke, it was just yourself and Mike, so the two founding members. Yeah. And now you have Connie who plays lead guitar for you. Yeah. But uh, you've had set band for the last couple of years. How was that recording? Was it a great? Lot easier? Uh, yeah. yeah, an awful lot easier. I mean, when me and Mike did the first album, it was just us. Yeah. And we'd go into a studio for two hours every week. So we'd write whatever parts. We might get the guitars for one song done and then come away and write another bit and get the bass for that track done then take a break went to another song do the guitars then go back to the first song and Mike would do the lyrics and it was all over the place yes. but uh, I'd imagine it's a bit quicker now oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice now when everyone has their part and one member goes in writes what they want to write and then sends it off to the re- rest of the lads and they put down whatever they want to put down and it makes the process a lot easier so uh, starting a metal band in Limerick uh, the metal scene is decent Oh yeah, to some extent, you know, like you have Siege of Limerick, and then recently mm. we had the gig in King John's Castle. So, mm. what what was it like seeing that gig go ahead? That was surreal. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of props due to the people who organised that. Um, it's great for the city, um, especially having something like the castle. Yeah, you know, right in the border. So but when you have these kind of Viking metal bands, and then they're playing in a, a castle, what better place to put them? <laughs> you know. But uh, what did it mean to yourselves to see the support for metal? Oh, it's fantastic. That came from all over Ireland, really, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, A couple of people even came over from England for it. Yeah. Um, It's really good to see Limerick getting a little bit more of that. Because normally people from Limerick have to travel to Cork sometimes, mostly Dublin, to see proper big headline gigs. Yeah. And to see it being brought right here to our doorstep. It's fantastic, you know. And was there people there, like, who are new (coughs) to the metal scene in Limerick, or...? As in people who came... Like, people from Limerick who just came to the gig, you know? Oh, because of the novelty it, factor. Yeah, is this opening new doors to people, like? Yeah, it has to be, yeah. do you know? It has to be really opening up eyes and making them aware of another world that's out there, you know? Especially when you bring it to the doorstep like that. Yeah, yeah. You know? And uh, from someone who is playing in the scene in a metal band, uh, what is the scene like in Limerick? Very strong. Yeah? Very strong. Um, we have an awful lot of bands, but stylistically they're all so different do you know if you're into stone or doom stuff the slung from a tree and then if you're into thrash stuff there's ourselves and others and do you know it's well, it's hard to pin down what you do yeah that's how we like it it is very varied yeah like there's a lot of uh melodic tunes there there's some really heavy tunes you know yeah there's a pitfall that a musician can fall into when they're learning and they get very comfortable with couple of tricks yeah they're, they're like oh i can do that really well and then that ends up in everything so when they come to write a song 
and they're listening to what they have so far, they end up adding what they know rather than what the song needs. So if you if you're able to pull yourself back and give the song what it needs rather than what you feel you know best, it opens up yeah. music completely. Every song will be different, and that's the way to have it as well. Because if you're sending off songs and you see Dublin bands are coming to bigger venues and you want to be the support, you have more to choose from. Yeah. Oh, what will we send off now to show them that we fit on that bill, that we fit in that lineup? Um, da, 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 look down through all the tracks. Oh, that one's kind of like the headliner. Send that off, sure. You know, it really makes it a lot more accessible. And uh, how long did it take you to realise that, like when you were forming the band yourself? And like, it happened without even thinking about it. Yeah, because we love so much music and listen to so much music that, depending on what we were listening to at the time, would depend would influence what you're doing. What the next song yeah. would be. So I know you, you were telling me before that you're a massive uh, Metallica fan. Oh yeah. Yeah, is that still influ- is that influence still there? Would you? Oh, it? I don't think it'll ever go. No. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, all my friends, whenever I write a riff, they're like, "It's great, but it sounds like Metallica, man. It sounds like Metallica." <laughs> man. So I have to always fight that main influence to push it back a little. Yeah. Um, not from a ripping off point of view, but because their style seems to fit with mine so easily. But I think when you think about metal, Metallica is probably the most famous band in terms of people who aren't really into that genre of music yeah. you know so i'd imagine it does crop up now and then yeah, yeah. we had a, we had an issue recently where we were going over a new song in the studio and uh i had come up with the riffs and stuff and not realizing it like i would never rip off another band but i had written a riff that was already a song by an existing band yeah note for note <laughs> tempo everything the same and i was like you cannot be serious <laughs> So we had to rejig the whole song. It does happen from time to time, just yeah. through no one's fault. But uh, but there's so much music out there, it must uh, be hard to write something completely original. Oh, yeah. Everything yeah. has to be borrowed, even if you don't know you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. There's only so many note combinations, and they will overlap. Yeah. And uh, how do yourself and Mike and Connie get around that? We have a weird way of recording. Yeah. Um, I've seen some videos and it does look a bit odd. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the stuff that goes on is your recordings, you know. Oh, it's great fun. <laughs> but uh, one, of, one of the weirdnesses, we always put track our guitars first. Because what an awful lot of bands do is the drums go down first. But yeah, we find keep the it, tempo and stuff. Yeah, but if, if your drummer is listening to a metronome, just one, two, three, yeah, like that, he's not going to know, okay, the song should pick up here or it should fall back here and but if he has, has a riff to listen to he can listen to where i'm chugging a little faster or where i'm putting a little more meat into it yeah, you know? yeah. and he knows where to pick it up and hit harder or where to pull back so we always track our guitars first and then like one member will write their parts arrange the song that's that and then after that the next member will come in write their parts that goes down so everyone has their say in the song yeah but um that must be a tough process as well yeah, it's very difficult. A lot of people don't like giving up control over their creative things, like, you know. That's true. It's hard to do. Yeah. It's hard to give it up, especially when it's your idea and you feel it reflects you yeah. and your personality. But um, you learn to do it very quickly. And where would you draw inspiration for uh, lyrics? I know it's probably Mike's gig mostly writing the lyrics and stuff, but uh, is mm. there a place that you draw your inspiration for from a lot of songs in real life or anything? Mike's lyrics are drawn from some void in his head it, it's <laughs> you never know really where they're coming from and yeah. especially with lyrics like when we write together sometimes we say to each other god we're very different in how we do this um they're all poems that yeah. he, poetry that he writes based on how he's feeling the exchanges he has mm. with people interpretations of scenarios he's been in but they're so metaphorical that when you're reading it outside of the music without the backing and it doesn't sound full, you're reading it thinking, these are, these are the ravings of a madman, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, no, it always comes good. He's yeah. good like that. But uh, yourself and Mike are friends since you're kids. Oh yeah, we met when we were around 14. So how is it being in a band with one of your best friends from oh, such a young age? Like, you know? It's fantastic. And it's great having someone that you're... You're so clued in on that you know 100% that he knows what's going on in your head at any moment. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to tell him. And you're able to be honest and everything. And Oh, yeah. 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 That makes it very easy for an on-stage performance when someone, yeah. when someone knows you that well. Because you can relax. There's, no, there's going to be no fuck-ups because yeah. they know what you're going to do before you even tell them. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, you've uh, released a new song recently. Yeah. 
and you recorded it with uh, Alan Atkins. Yep, Alan of Judas Priest. Yeah, the and, people uh, know him of Judas Priest. Yeah, and Sean Bourne of uh, Meat Space. So, what was it like making a, a track with like someone like Alan Atkins? <laughs> surreal. Yeah, very very surreal. H- how did it come about? Um, but I met him through Jeff Waters, who we worked with in the past. Yeah, and um, we just started exchanging messages and. I was always very classic rock orientated, the same as him. He wrote some of the biggest metal songs that ever existed. Yeah, yeah. Songs like Victim of Change and, and, you know, some iconic Judas Priest songs. And um, we always loved collaborating. So I just pitched it to him, would he be interested in working with a band that looked up to him? And he had some free time, luckily. Cool. So, yeah, he, he records with Paul May, who used to, to be the guitarist for Judas Priest as well. So he had access to the studio and everything for putting down his tracks and so the timing was perfect couldn't have worked out better yeah and uh, tell, tell us about the track what oh there's an awful lot going on in it um, stylistically it's an absolute mix because yeah. Sean would be very dreamscapey with his music and he's into tribal drumming and Middle Eastern instruments and Alan then is coming from such a structured classic rock yeah. background and then there's also, like we were saying, we record so many different styles, we don't know what we are yet. <laughs> so uh, we just went with it and found our melodies and put down whatever felt like it worked. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone has kind of their musical say on the track, which I'm very happy with. Do you know, everyone's influence fits together and is heard. Works together as a blend, but also stands apart. Yeah, yeah. So everyone can find their own identity in it, which is nice. And uh, in terms of the lyrics, did Alan write his own piece or did you come up with them for him? Alan wrote his own lyrics. Yeah. Yeah. So what way did you work around that? Not know like he obviously didn't come into the studio to record with G, you sent something off to him. Mm. And the, the the weird thing about it was finding space for Mike's lyrics, finding space for Alan's lyrics. Yeah. What's enough space for Alan? What's enough space for Mike? Because there's a respect thing when you're working with an artist that big. Um but then you're fighting, are we overloading the track with lyrics? So what I got Mike to do was record his lyrics, write and record them without knowing what Alan was going to do. Yeah. Put that aside and then sent Alan the instrumental track and got him to write and record lyrics for this song that he would do. Neither one of the two singers heard the other singer's parts. And then I told them both, okay, I'm going to go away with these. And I went into the studio and chopped and moved parts. And That must have been a tough job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite difficult. It, it probably took longer than the whole recording process. <laughs> oh yeah, the editing always takes longer. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's a perfect sound. You, you always, as a songwriter, have an idea in your head for what you want to sound like. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's what you want the song to sound like, or you want yourself to sound like to people. But it goes through so much from start to finish that getting it to nail that sound is impossible. Yeah. There has to be a bit of leeway, you know. Now, in terms of uh, the whole metal industry, mm. like you've worked with some fairly big names. Mm. Who, who would be your, the biggest that you think you've worked with or your favourite to work with? For me, it would definitely be Jeff Waters. Yeah. Yeah, working with a guitar player like that was unbelievable. And I still remember when he sent back my song with his solo on it yeah. and how that sounded. And how that felt to have someone like him playing with me backing it yeah, is yeah. unbelievable. You know, it's a feeling most people never experience. Mm-hmm. Now, so. like, you're you're a small enough band from Limerick, like, when mm. you think about it, and you're working with all these, I suppose they could be rock gods to a lot of people, like, mm. you know, so what does that feel like? Absolutely surreal, but yeah. I think social media has made it so much more accessible. But even at that, like uh, social media, I know they're accessible and stuff, but mm. they don't have to get back to you. They don't even have to respond to you. They don't. I think it, if they see a bit of cheek, yeah. you know, if, if you're a bit <laughs> cheeky about how you go about it, you just treat them normally, yeah, but yeah. also act like, even though you're not, you act to them like you're on their level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you make a bit them of confidence f- there, yeah. like, you know. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people would go tail between the legs, oh, could you throw my band a bone? It's... <laughs> you got to make them feel like they want to work with you. Assert yourself. Like, yeah. yeah. And that gets their attention. And then hopefully the lyrics and the music and that'll speak the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. When they look into you and they say, okay, these guys aren't half bad. 
you know. And obviously the fact they record with you means that they were impressed. But uh, have you received feedback from them after releasing the track? Oh, yeah. We've, yeah. Ke- we've kept in touch with all the musicians we've worked cool. with. So it's quite nice. We're building a nice little community yeah, yeah. ourselves, a nice little family. The community is the thing, really, in any mm. industry, I think. You know, mm. Because especially with something like metal, because it's not massive in Ireland, like it's big. It's, it's not. But yeah. the thing about it is, it's the one thing I've experienced where the people who are into it are into it more than anything else in this world. Yeah, yeah. And they will always be into it more than anything. So when you have a culture that's that devout to its interest, that's very peculiar yeah. how that happens, you know. And what does it mean to you as a band that are up and coming, like, you know? Oh, it's fantastic because it, it means any context you make or people who come that you meet who come to your show and you end up making friends with them, yeah. it'll always be there because that interest is always there. Um, you see it every time you go to an event like the Siege of Limerick and the people who turn up at it, they're like a family. Yeah. You know, and even that guy drinking his pint over there, I've never met him, but this is an unspoken, how you do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because we're joined in this interest. So. Like I was at one of your gigs in pharmacy a while ago. Hmm. It was in last year at the stage. May 12th, 2018. May 12th, 2018. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't know anyone there, but sure. After about half an hour, I think everyone was coming over chatting and, yep. you know, you're getting a nod or something, you know. Yeah. It's kind of very inviting. It's, yeah. it's not what you'd expect when you think of, like, heavy death metal or whatever. Or, you it's know. not. It's not. <laughs> but uh, looks can be deceiving. Yeah, it's true. You know? Never judge a book by its cover and all. Yeah. yeah. So um, the recording process, you have that done. It's not the best time for musicians mm. because you have things like Spotify and all the streaming stuff, sales of CDs of Mm. plummeted like you know but what does that affect you that much no yeah. not really so I, know, um, I know like uh, anytime you release a new track it's just straight up oh yeah YouTube I just or whatever, you know? me and the lads just throw it out because yeah. we'd just be happy if someone's listening to it yeah, yeah, yeah. like we're not doing this for a career yeah. we have our jobs you know yeah, yeah. and uh, this is just fun to us so the idea that someone would want to listen to it I don't know I'd feel bad charging them for it yeah. you know <laughs> Because it is an interest. Yeah. It's an interest of ours. That's why we do it. And it's an interest of theirs. You do it very theirs. well. That's the thing. <laughs> Thank you. But it's an interest of ours. That's why we do it. It's an interest of theirs. That's why they listen to it. Yeah. You know, I feel charging for it. It's that cut off. I think it'd be good for music overall. The fact that the bottom is falling out of it. Yeah. And that people aren't paying for it anymore. Because in the next 10 years, what I feel will happen is artists will stop aspiring to make money out of it. Those days are gone. You know, yeah. you have your big bands now and they will always be big, but there's no one coming up following them who will ever be that big again. Yeah. yeah. Um, because technology and the world we live in with social media, it has made it possible for anyone to. You think it's oversaturated? Like, yeah, it's yeah. made it possible for anyone to create in some shape and form. Like I think now we've had more one hit wonders than any other time. Exactly. You know, when you think about it. Yeah. But, um. Oh no, I think it's good for music because once people stop aspiring to make money out of it, people will make music for music's sake again. Passion. Then you'll see real creativity coming back yeah. and experimentation. The year doing. Yeah, the likes of the 60s and the 70s, you know, it's lulled since then. Yeah. So I think it'll be good for it overall. And uh, the other side of that then is there is money to be made in gigging and a lot of performers like to perform. They'd mm. rather be on the stage than in a record studio. Mm. Would you rather be on stage than in the recording studio? Oh, that's a discussion we've had an awful lot. Uh, certain members yeah. love the live side of it and certain members love the creating and the writing and yeah, the recording yeah. side of it. And as long as certain members never have a problem with writing and recording in the studio, other members have to go along with the playing live part of it. It's an unspoken <laughs> thing between us. But no, we, we try to bring in all sides of it and respect everyone's interests and what they want to get out of being in a band yeah. so we just take the whole thing as a package you know and uh, what, what's it like performing your tracks live and seeing a crowd react to it like because I, I know you, you you said it's nice that people listen to it yeah but actually seeing them listen to it and enjoy it must be something else it's very satisfying yeah Do you know that makes it all worthwhile and uh like taught me through your your part on stage you know like uh, not not everybody gets to go up on stage mm. Yeah. Um, like what's it like looking down at say a, a bit of a pit there or a few lads headbanging or whatever you know 
you can you really feel clued in with them yeah um a, a song is such a personal thing and it's such a a personal art form in general but that song is like a musical representation of your creativity something very deep within you and then when you see someone enjoying it to that level where it's making them act physically or you can see it reflect physically in their in their actions yeah it feels like that connection is a lot deeper than spoken word could ever be you know yeah it's it's a very tribal thing when you connect with someone musically you know like you see people dancing around the campfires tribe drums and they're all connected through that beat through that pulse yeah um it's very similar to that and you mentioned the personal side of it there like obviously writing lyrics is a lot more personal than writing a riff or would it be like that's it, a good it, question is it, is it tough having someone recite your lyrics and a crowd know that they're yours or is it tough to play a riff and then think like is this actually a good riff <laughs> mm, I, I I think both in a way because lyrics are so personal yeah and for Mike exa- for example to be stood up there and singing these words out that's a very personal thing and they reflect him um a riff then is it's like something deeper than word yeah and it's very difficult to try and convey to someone without words how you're feeling so when you find a musical way to do that it's i think it just feels very deep because of how difficult it is to go through it in the studio i think the the lyrics would be more personal yeah. But is it tough to get up there and hear your lyrics being recited? Like, Oh, yeah, it would be. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the track that you have, tell us about it. Oh, uh, Endless Fall. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, we spent six months sitting on it because... Um, I know we met, I think it was at the gig last year. Yeah. And you mentioned to me that you were going to record the track, yeah. you know, so... Yeah, we, it's been we sp- a very long process. Oh, yeah. yeah. We spent about six months recording it and then six months sitting on it yeah. because we were going to wait until Alan had released his own album and then we could coincide with that. Yeah. But um, unforeseen for circumstances, he wasn't sure what was happening on his end and then we didn't know on our end and we didn't want to wait too long after him being so good and being a part of it first. Yeah. So we decided, look, we'll just put it out August 1st, just throw it out. It's not going to be the last song that we come up with. Yeah, yeah. There's no point in holding on to them. So we were delighted to get it out finally. Because what we didn't want to happen was to sit on it for so long that when we do release it, it's no longer a reflection of where we are now. Music and bands, they're always moving and changing yeah. and evolving. So you don't want to sit in it to the point where when you've done it and you put it on, people are like, oh, that's great. And you're like, it's not that special to me anymore because of... Well, I think... we. Most art forms, the longer the creator spends looking at something or mm. listening to something, you just get so used to it that it's not specialty anymore. Do you get yeah. me? Is it the same with the music? Yeah, it, yeah. W- it would be, uh, especially with the mixing and the mastering. It's advised when you're mixing and mastering a track. And once you've recorded it and you've gone through certain parts of that, you come away from it for about a month. Yeah. And you don't listen to it. Because then when you sit down ears. to it, fresh ears, yeah. yeah. But that's because you do get ear fatigue from listening to the same thing over and over and yeah. it starts to affect your creative decisions. Um, so yeah, it would over time be affected by hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. But on another level then, they will always be special because they're achievements. Yeah. Do you know, they're personal goals. Well, especially the people that you're recording with. Like, you know, it's always yeah. going to mean something. Like yeah. you said, Jeff Waters and stuff, mm. you know. They're very special experiences yeah. and they're not ones everyone gets to experience. Yeah. So when you do get to, you cherish them. And when you first picked up the guitar, did you always think in your head, I'm going to be recording tunes with these people someday? Not a hope. No. Not a clue that I have. <laughs> you know, I'm very much a bedroom player before they spend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seven, eight hours a day just playing along Metallica. That was my life. <laughs> and now it's, it's changed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what was it like recording with Jeff or knowing that you were going to record with Jeff that time? Unbelievable. We were going into the studio on the morning I heard to record a different song. Yeah. And we were meant to be in the studio at two o'clock. We ended up having to scrap that song because I heard from him at ten past twelve. 
and he emailed me saying absolutely let's do it but i only have two days before i'm on the road again oh, i'm just back from north american tour i have this weekend and then i'm off on european tour <laughs> so i had to write and record the song that evening to get it back to him to work yeah. on the next day to have back to me um so ran into the studio figured out two riffs a verse and a chorus in 10 minutes put them down arranged parts around it built the song over i think two and a half three hours got it slightly mixed just all the levels to somewhat yeah you know it's like putting on your best dress when someone comes to dinner <laughs> you know <laughs> gotta make it sound right and uh sent it off to him and um yeah he sent it he, he sent it back to me crazy fast i think 20 minutes he had the solo recorded no way yeah <laughs> written and recorded in 20 minutes that's he a big just, difference to the, the six months <laughs> yeah, yeah he just he, he just improvised on the spot and had the whole thing laid out and he's like there that'll do you now it's like <laughs> Yes, it will. Amazing. That will do me. Yeah. So um, back to this Endless Fall. Where hmm. can people listen to it? Uh, it's available on all platforms. Yeah. Uh, we distribute to Root Notes. So it goes available on Spotify, SoundCloud, Pandora, everything. All the usual stuff. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what's next for Zero? Uh, at the moment, we're working on another track called Quickfire. More of a new metal track. Yeah. Um, we have plans then to do both a live in the studio EP and a acoustic ep acoustic yeah how does metal uh, transfer into acoustic? unbelievably well yeah. if you know how to do it right <laughs> so that'll probably take a while to master i'd say yeah we're hoping to have them done by christmas yeah so. nice one nice one yeah so uh, where can people keep up to date with zero um you can find us on the facebook page zero limerick or on instagram excellent yeah. and then just keep the rice peeled for gigs and yeah ep drops yeah we'll throw them out Dave, thanks a million for joining us. Thanks, Keen. Best of luck with everything. Thanks, man. You've been listening to We Are Limerick, a Limerick Post podcast. For more news, sport, entertainment and more podcasts, visit limerickpost.ie.